Oh, this thing. Ooh, which one of those did you? This one. Okay. okay. Yeah, so I don't know if, if all of you, I know some of you do, but, um, but you, you may all not realize um, how much, uh, at, at least a large part of NCATS was uh, incubated within genome. Um, <clears throat> I got to genome in 2002 and left, um, well, when, when NCATS got formed in 2011, so I was there nine years. Um, and really, uh, a, a fair amount of what I'm going to show you was um, sort of a little, a little marsupial uh, in, the, uh, in the pouch of genome. And when NCATS got formed, we kind of jumped out and are kind of now on our own. But, but NCATS is only about two years old. So we are, um, I often like to say, we're, we're like a toddler uh, who's uh, still learning to walk. We have a lot of potential, uh, but we're still making a mess. Um, and we hope eventually <coughs> we will do something uh, uh, to uh, really meet our, uh, meet our potential. Um, so, so this is the problem that we work in, and this is the slide I show every time I give a talk, uh, and uh, and it's uh, it, which is that, uh, and this is a problem I know that you think about a lot too. Which to me is really the, the 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 biomedical research question of our era, that is that we live in this really paradoxical time, right, where we know more about ourselves and health and disease, perhaps exemplified by the Genome Project, but uh, by by fundamental advances in general. But at the same time, uh, we are uh, not making a lot of headway with improvement uh, in health outcomes. And if you haven't read, if you want to be depressed, you can, if you're not depressed enough from reading the post or something, you can read this as an IOM report that came out about a year ago that was pithily titled Shorter Lives, Poorer Health. And it talks about just how unnecessarily unhealthy Americans are. And a lot of this is because, certainly not all, but a lot of it is because we are really bad at transitioning discoveries over here uh, into health outcomes. And, and there's a lot of uh, um, outcomes as a result of this or knock-on effects that uh, the drug device diagnostic uh, development system is, is a mess. Um, since I left Merck uh, about 10 years ago, the pharma uh, industry has laid off, uh, I don't know, Lon could probably tell us uh, the up-to-date numbers, but something north of 200,000 people. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of those are researchers uh, because of this problem. The clinical trial system in this country is a mess, um, to put it uh, mildly. Uh, and, and even when we do discover interventions that improve people's health in clinical trials, our system is actually terrible at getting those uh, transitioned in, to, to all the patients who could benefit from them. And, and so as a result, people are unhealthier than they should be. Uh, and uh, not to put too fine a point on it, funders of the enterprise, public and private, have either gotten impatient with us or have lost patients with us completely. Um, and you see this uh, both uh, in the flight of uh, uh, capital from the life science markets and the private sector uh, and the uh, difficulty of getting across what NIH does in the public sector. Um, and those of you who have been around NIH know uh, just in the time that I've been here in the last 11 years, that, that conversation has changed quite dramatically. I think it's, I think it's, uh, I think it's fixable, uh, but I think we have, to, we have to recognize it's a problem. This, this is the other thing that, that keeps me up late, late at night. Um, uh, I don't know if those of you know this. Anybody who, are, who works in the drug development field will know this. Uh, I, I show this because it's, uh, it will be, have particular currency for you. I know um, uh, uh, Eric liked showing the, the, uh, the Moore's Law um, and uh, sequencing costs uh, graph. Well, in the world that I live in, <clears throat> we don't have Moore's Law. We have E-Room's Law, which is Moore's Law spelled backwards. Uh, and it's spelled backwards because of the dramatically negative productivity growth in uh, therapeutic development over the last 60 years. That is, that the cost, that the, the number of drugs produced per billion dollars has gone down monotonically by half every nine years since 1950. So just think about that. It, it, this, this is the reason why pharma is going bankrupt, right? There is no way you can keep this uh, going uh, uh, as a business. And, and it's also why uh, people are unhealthier than they should be. And just in case you're wondering, this number, this if you extrapolate out, this goes to zero in 2040. So we'll probably all be retired by then, uh, but uh, going to zero is not good for any of us because uh, we're all going to have Alzheimer's disease by then, and it would be nice to have a treatment, which ain't going to happen at the current rate. So one of the, and, and one of the things I find most frightening about this is you think about the ethical changes in biology and medicine that have happened since 1950, and none of them has affected this slope. It's really quite terrifying when you think about it. Um, so one of uh, uh, NCAT's jobs is, is to try to make this flatten out and, and, and eventually go back up. I'm, I'm going to make the argument that a lot of this is a scientific problem. The translational space is remarkably empirical. We really do not understand most of what we do in this space. And I think uh, as somebody who comes from a mechanistic background, um, it, it's obvious when you move into this space that it's much more like medicine, clinical medicine, than it is science. 
it's it, and, and those of you who are docs will know what I'm talking about. Okay, so this is another graph I show all the time. You know, it's a normal, because that's the problem. Where's the opportunity? You know, you know this one. I need an updated graph here uh, that goes uh, number of Mendelian disorders identified. It's now, you know, north of 4,500. So, so here are all these rare diseases, the molecular basis of which, thanks to you all, uh, we now know. And, um, and I don't know, when, when, is, when are we supposed to know all of them? Thanks to you guys, probably another, what's, what's the number now, five years or something? Yeah. So. Uh, um, and, uh, but whatever it is, you know, if, if you go back, you know, 15 years ago, the number was less than 50, uh, and, and now it's, now it's 4,500, 5, or so. So, so this ought to give us, uh, uh opportunity to intervene. Uh, and of course we have this, uh, I always love showing this. You guys still show this, the, the, uh, the lollipop graph? Um, I, I know, I know, I know Terry shows it, uh, but, but, <laughs> uh, uh, but, but I love this um, for, for all the reasons that you know. This, is a, this represents opportunity, right? Targets, potentially. Uh, and, and I always, I, I, I want to go back and show this. This, this is, uh, those of you who know me for a while know, this is the graph, I, this is a slide I always used to show when I first got the genome, that the idea was that we were going to create this translation toolbox uh, when I got the genome. That was my, my job, was to be the translation guy at the Genome Institute. Um, and, and it's interesting to reflect on what we were going to put into this. Uh, you know, one was, uh, by the time I got here, HapMap had started, right? Uh, and uh, ENCODE had started, um, and, uh, and MGC was, had started as well. So, you, so we have, you know, uh, heritable variation, we have functional and uh, uh, structural elements, we have cDNAs, and we uh, started, one of the first things I did was to work on uh, transcriptome reference sets, but this was, Back in 2003, so it was really archaic technology, MPSS technology, if you remember any of that uh, back then. Um, um, creating sRNAs, which I'll t tell a little bit more about. Uh, this knockout mouse project, which was one of the things that um, uh, I started along with a bunch of other people here. Um, uh, and then, anybody remember this? Human base? That was something that never happened. His, that's an interesting. If you get Eric drunk enough, he'll tell you why this didn't uh, happen. It's basically a political issue. Uh, and then, and then we put this into the toolbox as well. And when we, when I started talking about this, nobody knew what those things were. Uh, it, it, and, it, and it was really because if you think about all of them except small molecules, they all operate at the gene level, the locus level, or the mRNA level. But one of the things that the Genome Project told us, of course, is just, it's it's really proteins, number of proteins that 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 confer or not number of genes uh, that pr confers organismal complexity in health and disease. So we needed a tool which allows us to manipulate Mother Nature at the level that Mother Nature works, which is a protein level. And so small molecules uh, work at, at the protein level. Um, okay, so uh, I, I love this one. Anybody, who, who do you think said this? Come on, it's got to be one person, it's got to be her, right? Uh, and, you know, here's an example that we all love to quote, you know, and how many of these are there, I don't know. Um, but, but it's one of the things that, you know, we're interested in, you're, you're interested in, uh, in, in making uh, happen a lot more often. However, uh, I always like to point out that what I've learned as a neurologist and then as a geneticist uh, was, was a very hard lesson, which is that this, <clears throat> so even you cardiologists in the room, I don't know what this is. <laughs> uh, that's a brain. <laughs> and, First of all, and, and that big black thing, that's not normal. Uh, that's a stroke. Uh, and, and, but I also learned as a geneticist uh, that this, which is uh, the, uh, the original paper uh, from Linus Pauling on the cause of sickle cell disease in 1949, does not equal this. And just because you can figure out why something is broken doesn't mean you can fix it. It is a completely different exercise, and it requires completely different uh, skill, a skill set, et cetera, uh, and uh, whenever I go any place, and, and you probably get heckled with this too, I go places and I talk about, about how the genome is going to help us develop new drugs, and there's always somebody who says, look, buddy, 1949, you still ain't got a drug based on this insight. So don't talk to me about all these new genetic targets until you fix this one. Now, we're working on that. I'll show you that in a second, but, but it is a fair point. So what is the NCAT's mission in, in all of this maelstrom? Um, it, this is the mission, and I just want to emphasize a couple of words. Um, one is we're a catalyst. Uh, you know, we, we're 1.8% we're, we're of the, of the, of the uh, NIH budget. Um, uh, Eric reminds me that, uh, or maybe it was Rudy, uh, that we're now bigger than you guys, ho, 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 uh, as of, um, uh, I guess, this year. Um, uh, uh, because of one very large program that you've all heard of, the CTSA program. Um, but uh, to catalyze, uh, the other reason we're a catalyst is that, that we're disease agnostic, like you all. And if you're going to talk about translation to improve health, then we, we need to demonstrate uh, improvements in health by working at particular diseases. And because we, all ha we have all 7,000 diseases, like you all, we have to, we have to 
uh, come up with uh, uh, improvements in, we have to do everything we do collaboratively. So it's one of the reasons that NCATS is really fundamentally different from, uh, from most of the other ICs. So we focus on uh, innovative methods and technologies. That's really what we're about. That will enhance the development, testing, implementation of diagnostics and therapeutics, and we're, we're um, uh, disease agnostic. Now, when I became director, um, uh, I, I actually changed this mission a little bit. I tried to do it um, officially, uh, but as uh, uh, Eric discovered when he tried to do the reorg of NHGRI that he eventually uh, uh, succeeded in doing, simply to change the words in a mission statement of one IC, of one operational division, and one, cap and one cabinet department uh, actually requires an act of Congress. So I was told, don't try to change the, the mission statement, but I, I do think about it differently. So look, there's two problems I have with this. One is just diagnostics and therapeutics, and I really think about intervent interventions broadly, behavioral interventions, et cetera. Secondly, it's not good enough to just make diagnostics and therapeutics. You actually got to show that they do something. So, so what we really are focused on is interventions that tangibly improve human health. That is a much bigger mission than this, which, which, is, which is much more limited. It's a very important distinction. Okay, so I love this uh, graph, and, and a lot of you probably seen me, sh or figure, because a lot of you have seen me show this before. This was actually made by Francis's office as an organizational chart of the NIH. Now, this, I like to think about this as, as, a, as a silo, as, a, as an aerial view of the silos that make up NIH, really. Uh, but you notice in the middle here, you know, NCATS is supposed to be a horse of a different color here, but it's also supposed to be a, a, a convener, an adapter, um, a occupier of the tragedy of the commons. It's all the kinds of things that we think about ourselves as. And, and it really is true that probably a lot like you all, um, and, and this is not by mistake, not by uh, happenstance, you know, we don't think about uh, about about the, the the about the translational space in a parcelated way. We don't think about what's different about diseases. We think about what's common to diseases and what's common about the translational space. And we're big on integration and connections because we're we're actually confident that that's the way Mother Nature designed the human body. You know, knee bone connected to the leg bone and all that. And if we approach the translational problem that way, we will we will have better better success. But because of where NCATS works, um, and, and per perhaps best exemplified by the fact that we don't, NCATS, unlike any other NIH, uh, institute, doesn't do any basic research. Um, we really start at target validation. Um, uh, even though I'm a geneticist by training, um, we, 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 we don't do any basic research. Uh, as a result, you know, our, we're sort of right shifted, if you want to think of it that way, in the development spectrum. And so we have much tighter and um, more systematic interactions with uh, disease advocacy groups and nonprofits and FDA, pharma, biotech, VC, all those kinds of things. Okay, so I've mentioned this before, um, uh, uh, but, but it's important to understand. If, if you're not familiar with the, this, this translational uh, vernacular, it's, 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 it's worth knowing about. It has some problems, but it's, it's, it's worth uh, uh, um, having in your lexicon because it is something that people use, and, and I actually do find it reasonably helpful. So, so the important thing is that NCATS works across this space. So what am I talking about here? That T1, uh, uh, in most people's vernacular, goes from a target, a putative target, through target validation to an intervention which is shown to be uh, potentially useful in a proof of concept trial, say a phase 2A trial, if it's a, if it's a regulatory, regulatorily uh, uh, relevant intervention. Then to go from a proof of concept to approval is, T, is, is T2. So that's a bigger population, uh, phase 3, et cetera. However, that's really where the next phase of translation starts. So you haven't, you haven't actually gotten to health because you've, you've occupied, you, you're working in this hothouse environment of a clinical trial. People in the wild, in their wild type environment, eating all kinds of crazy things and doing all kinds of crazy things that you don't let them do in clinical trials, does the intervention actually work? And how do you get it to people who, all the people who could benefit from this? And then if you get it to all the people who benefit from it, do you actually show that you had an effect on population health? So, so whenever I'm asked to explain, you know, give me an example of this. So my old company uh, made a drug called Vioxx, you may have heard of, uh, and, and, and it really had its downfall in T3. It, it, it actually got to approval quite nicely. The problem came when it went to many, many, many more patients than had been in the clinical trials, and you see this a lot. 
And, and, and my favorite example of the T4 problem is, is uh, postmenopausal estrogen. So you're all aware of the fact that, that in this space, in this space, this, this looked brilliant. You know, great uh, you know, biological rationale, looked great in all the animal studies, all the clinical studies, uh, got very widely uh, adopted. Uh, and then it turns out, given the results of the women's health study, we were actually killing people. So it's, it's, so it's important to, to, to not stop here or here or here or here until we get to health. And so, so that's a really important uh, issue. Now, I, I will grant you that probably most of what we would do with genome is either down here or maybe down here or here. You know, in the middle, um, maybe not so much, but, but you know, it would be interesting. You know, something that, you know, we've been talking about with genome. Um, and, and maybe you'll see this as I go on. Okay, so <laughs> sometimes people ask me, well, you know, translation is pretty straightforward, right? So what's, what, what's your problem? You know, what, what are the problems that you guys work on? And these are some of the problems that we work on. And if you look at all of these problems, they are the reasons that intervention development fails, um, uh, either in the preclinical stage, the first three, uh, or, or four, depending on your point of view, or in the clinical stage, uh, or in later uh, uh, translational stages. And you notice that there's, there's no uh, there's no disease listed here. And so, so this gets to a point that I mentioned before, that these are all problems that, is every, that are everybody's problem in general, but nobody's problem in particular. I mean, what I see is responsible for these things, which, which is why nobody solved them. I mean, they are scientific and organizational problems. They're nobody's problem in, in particular, so they're tragedy of the commons problems, and if you're familiar with that term. So virtually everything NCATS does is in the tragedy of the commons uh, space. And, and if I thought about, you know, things that, that, that really uh, um, intersect with what you do at Genome and what I used to do, uh, these red ones are, are particularly relevant. Um, you know, why, why do drugs have, uh, or interventions have toxic effects that they're not supposed to? Why do they not have efficacies that they're supposed to? How to de-risk undruggable targets, state or interoperability, biomarker qualification, clinical diagnostic criteria. How do we find the appropriate patients to, to get an intervention to pharmacogenomics, if you want to call it that? Okay, so what's within NCATS? Uh, there's, there's, you could divide this roughly into three pieces. 80% of the budget is in the CTSA program, and if you don't know what that is, I'll tell you in a second. Um, uh, about 15% of it or so is in, is in rare diseases, um, and I, there's a lot of reasons for this. Part of it is because rare diseases are, are most often multi-system disease, uh, diseases, and so they don't fit nicely in any one institute. Um, I also like thinking of this, if not to be pejorative, th th I like to think about them as a sort of model organisms of the translational space. If you're going to try to work out novel ways of doing translation, you don't want to start with type 2 diabetes. You want to start with a relatively simple system, and, and rare diseases uh, represent that. Uh, and then we have a, about 5% of the effort, maybe a little more, is focused on uh, technology development uh, without an, a, 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 a specific disease uh, implication, uh, you know, as a, as, as a proximate outcome. So one of the things that I, I'm, you know, sort of when you become director of an institute, and those of you who run things will know this, you know, you always have to have things that people can remember and put on their T-shirts and, you know, stuff like that. So th this is what I've been beating into the heads of everybody at NCATS, is that it's not good enough to simply develop new ways to solve that long laundry list of problems that I, that I gave you. We have to demonstrate in individual use cases that they actually work better than the previous methods, or else nobody should believe us. But if they do work better, then we can't assume that everyone will stop the old ways of doing things and all of a sudden see the light and start doing what they're supposed to, and w whether these are scientists or physicians or patients. And so we have a lot of emphasis on dissemination science as well, which as you know probably is a uh, science in its own right. Okay, so I'm going to start at the clinical part and work backwards now. Um, um, so the Division of Clinical Innovation, so this is currently, it's uh, mainly the CTSA program. Um, and, and here's the vision. This will not surprise you that the first is development, demonstration, implementation of methods and technologies. And this the next word is important. Logarithmically improve the efficiency of clinical research. Translational problems are so large that it is not good enough to think about arithmetic improvements. I think about this really, uh, you know, I think about everything in terms of genetics and genomics because it's my background. It, just think if, if sequencing technologies had gotten 10 percent better, 20 percent better, 30 percent better. Wow, great. You know, we, we'd be toast. We wouldn't be anywhere. It's only because the people at the Institute said, no, 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 logarithmic improvements, $1,000 genome. And, and so, because that's suitable to the scale of the problem we're dealing with here. Um, 
secondly, uh, there's a whole other area that we can talk about if you're interested. This, this, in what I realized taking on this job after being away from academic medicine for almost 20 years is that what I grew up with, the tradition of clinical investigation and phenotyping, which was the heart of what people did in academic medical centers, a lot of that has, has withered uh, because of the relentless pressure on reimbursements and academic departments having to make money, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, the, if you think about trying to make genotype phenotype correlations, we are now really good, thanks to you all, at doing genotypes. We are actually terrible at doing phenotypes. And we've actually lost a whole generation of people um, who, who never really learned how to do this. And so it's something that we're doing uh, within the CTSA program. Uh, so that gets into the, the training programs that we spend a lot of time doing. Uh, I think what we really need to have over the long term is something that I think about a lot. It's a robust academic discipline of translational research, which is going to have different metrics. It's not going to be papers in the cover of cell. Uh, they're going to be different metrics, um, but, uh, but and, and something I talk to the CTSA heads a lot. Uh, and then we're uh, really big on novels of engagement, uh, models for engagement of the various communities that we work with. And really, if you think about this, why, you know, why do we do this? You know, translational research by its name means we are carrying something from a place to a place, which indicates that where we're going ought to be of interest to somebody. So unless we know what that person is interested in, whether it's a, a clinical scientist or, a, uh, or a, a, a practitioner or somebody in the community, whatever, a patient advocacy group, what have you, uh, we're not going to understand what those problems are. So we like to have uh, um, those partners involved in every project we do from, from the beginning. So this is the CTSA program. Uh, it's a national consortium of medical research institutions. It's, this is the current map. Uh, it's probably one of these that I would guess probably most or all of the institutions that you come from if you come from an academic center. Um, uh, uh, so 62 of them now. Uh, these are legacy, um, large parts of these are legacy GCRC programs, if you, remember, if you know what that is. Um, uh, and we're still dealing with some of that legacy. Um, but the, the vision here is that this program will go from being what they have been for the last 20 or 30 years or 40 or 50 years in some cases, which are essentially glorified core facilities uh, to do clinical research within academic medical centers, which is not bad. It's just not enough. It's not commensurate to the scale of the problem to a national network for translational medicine. And actually, this, this committee that I'm going back to, to talk to uh, uh, after I leave here is a, is a new steering committee, which is focused very much on this question so that one would be able to uh, recruit for clinical trials across this network through an elect uh, a common electronic uh, health record infrastructure, have a common IRB structure, be able to recruit PIs, because most of the key opinion leaders are at these places as well, um, uh, have uh, uh, innovative clinical trial designs embedded into the metrics of the program um, uh, and, and overall improve the, the efficiency and quality of clinical research. Uh, and I'm hoping that a few years from now, uh, when I come back, I'm going to be able to talk to Lon, and Lon will not say to me, you know, we're uh, going overseas to do our clinical trials because we would love to do them here, but you guys are so inefficient and so costly that we can't afford to do it. That's what I hear from pharmas all the time. I don't, probably don't need to tell you what the uh, what the um, uh, statistics are in NIH-funded trials, they're actually um, quite bad, um, to put it mildly. Uh, so there's a lot of room for improvement here, and, and we're going to use the CTSAs to drive that. Um, part of the help here in doing this was an IOM report uh, that came out about six months ago. Um, on, on the CTSA program. If you're interested in it, you could, you could read it. But the uh, important, one of the important things was uh, to, uh, to, to really strengthen leadership of the program by NCATS um, and to focus on, 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 on clear deliverables and outcomes. The, there's a committee that we have that's a working group of our council, which is um, uh, helping us with this. And um, you can look for names that you recognize. I just want to point out, too, Ron Bartek, some of you probably know, who runs the Friedreich's uh, Research and Al uh, uh, Alliance, and Lynn Marks, who runs uh, uh, clinical research at GSK, um, as well as other folks that you probably know, Gary Gibbons, um, among others. So stay tuned on that. They're going to report um, in May uh, at our council. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what they come up with. And what I've asked them specifically to do is to focus on uh, uh, outcomes, clear outcomes that address critical translational, general translational questions to improve the quality and efficiency of translational research through the CTSA program. How do we do that? 
Okay, so if we move backwards now uh, from the clinical space into the preclinical space, uh, this is all of uh, what I built when I was a genome, actually. Um, so some of you have probably seen this, and it really hasn't changed much in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, and the idea here is that, that most academic investigators um, who want to get into the translational space just don't have the, the experience, the expertise, the facilities, uh, the knowledge, uh, et cetera, to do this. Um, and, uh, and so what we did when I came to Genome uh, now uh, almost uh, over 10 years ago, the idea was that we would set up an industry standard, industry scale uh, translational uh, uh, operation. Uh, which would recruit mainly people from biotech and pharma, uh, and, and but but the model is that all of those people would work in project teams and they would work collaboratively with academic investigators who were disease experts or target experts. So though this is our intramural program, it is the weirdest intramural program in NIH because it has no tenure, it has no tenure track, it has no independent PIs. Everybody works in project teams. Every project is a collaboration with somebody somewhere in the world. So it's it's very unusual. Uh, program. So what happens is uh, co uh, collaborators come to us uh, stuck at various stages and they go into one or another of these programs and what comes out the bottom are deliverables and those deliverables are either a physical entity, a drug, a, 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 a lead, a repurposed uh, a drug, a, a, a siRNA probe, uh, and or data that goes to the public domain. Uh, but but what and those those deliverables move the project forward down the translational pipeline. But the other thing is we like every project to be dual use projects. So they tell us they, they not only move a project forward, but they, they they have a paradigm technology development component. So they tell us how to do one of, one or more of these processes better. Um, I, I probably don't need to remind you, but but the current uh, uh, success rate going from here to here. Uh, is about 0.1 percent, takes about 13, 14, 15 years, and costs, depending on how you do the math, between two and six billion dollars. So, um, as I often say, something which fails 99.9 percent .9 of the time uh, uh, cannot be said to be optimized. So, <laughs> we are spending a lot of time working on this problem. And if you ask why, how is NCATS different from all of the farmers, like the pharma I used to work in, there's a critical difference. And that critical difference is we do not have a short term commercial imperative. We, I can tell you, every person in every farmer you go to, almost every one of them, they know what the problems are, but you can't, you can't support the research operation uh, doing those, doing that science. Somebody's got to do that science, and, and it can't really, it can't be done in a, in a for-profit environment. The other thing is that we work on the 95 percent of targets and diseases that are not de-risked enough uh, to work on in a, in a private sector environment. Okay, so every project is a collaboration with people all over the country. These are the places that these folks came from. Uh, just imagine the model here is, in order to get hired, you have to know the state of the art at one or more of these places, but the state of the art is terrible, so I don't want you to put in state of the art, 99.9% .9 failure rate, right? So you get hired, you got to tell me what the state of the art is, but you got to tell me how to do it better. And, 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 and when you bring in 150 people, which we have from all these different places, and you set them loose that way to focus on the science only and do it in a collaborative way where they are tied in with, with academic opinion leaders, you can make a lot of headway quite, quite rapidly. So this is the first center that I started um, back in 2003. Uh, currently has 200 collaborators in the target to lead space. So this assay development, high throughput screening, informatics, medchem, focused on, on sort of one minus pharma, the universe of targets and diseases that exists. You subtract out what biopharma works on. That's what we work on. Uh, and the mission is chemical sRNA probes, new technologies. Um, and just to give you a couple of examples of how we've done this. So, uh, it, it, one of the things that we started doing uh, a number of years ago uh, was to, to uh, uh, make genome-wide RNAi screening actually work. Those of you who've done this know that you could, it's actually quite easy to go out and buy uh, uh, a, an sRNA library, but the results you get for the most part are junk. And I, I have data that would curl your hair to show it to you. Um, uh, and I didn't bring these, but uh, the, you can often pick out individual genes that will allow you to move forward, but overall the data are simply not reliable. And uh, when we looked at, the more we looked into this, the more uh, actually shocked we were by this. So we started this center about five years ago um, to work to reduce the practice to doing genome-wide RNAi screening. Secondly, um, to develop um, a collaborative resource to do individual projects. And thirdly, to create the first public sector database of uh, RNAi data. It's amazing, 10 years after the Genome Project, there is no such database. Right, where you can go in and look at every, every, every gene in the genome knocked down one at a time and be able to mine those data. 
It's quite remarkable. And the reason is that the companies who make the S-iron oligos would not agree to make the data public. So being kind of a, using our convincing power, and Genome's familiar with this, um, we were able to get um, uh, Life Technologies to agree uh, to do this. Um, and so just last December, uh, we had a couple of great papers. This one, uh, and I don't show this just because Bob's here, uh, there's a really great paper on, uh, on mitophagy, uh, genes involved in mitophagy and Parkinson's disease uh, that was in Nature. And then uh, the same month uh, was this uh, um, uh, press release uh, uh, having gene silencing data available for the first time. So you can now get into these data are all in PubChem, we're putting them elsewhere too, uh, get in and look at every oligo um, and what its effect is in, in, these, in these screening systems. And just the one little, little, um, little uh, tickler I'll give you is that the results are absolutely not, uh, do not correlate with the genes that the companies say are being knocked down. They are oligo-specific, they are sequence-specific, but those sequences have almost nothing to do with the genes that are identified. And so I'll just leave that with you and you can, uh, and we figured out why that is, too. I don't have time to get into it, but it's, uh, it's a really interesting story. Okay, so if I then move on to the, to, the, to the small molecule side, we did exactly the same thing on the small molecule side. Um, this is a project we started years ago with Alan Sudaransky, who you know is a, a tenured investigator at the Genome Institute, working on small molecule chaperones for uh, misfolded glucosubrosidase in Gaucher disease. Um, without uh, just skip through about six years of work, uh, we've identified compounds that, uh, that bind these, that bind to mutant glucosuricidase, uh, are biochemical inhibitors, so they bind and inhibit the enzyme in a tube, in a cell-free system, but in a cell-based system, they actually increase uh, glucosuricidase activity, exactly as you'd expect with a chaperone. And uh, these have now been uh, licensed to two different companies, um, uh, Biogen and uh, uh, LTI uh, for further development, and we're now working on the, uh, the alpha-synuclein connection uh, to see how these compounds might affect alpha-synuclein levels. Um, another thing which was another technology development uh, area is, is working on the area of drug combinations. You're all aware that there's a lot of promise in drug combinations, a lot of diseases which can't be treated with single drugs. It's been very hard to do efficient screening of combinations for a variety of reasons. A number of companies tried to do this, combinatorics, a lot of you probably remember. They, again, really smart people, but they were limited by the technology available at the time. So. Uh, and also the need to make money, because they were a company. Uh, so we had uh, the opportunity now, about 10 years later, to say, well, gosh, you know, isn't there a better way to do this? Uh, and so uh, without skipping through, uh, skipping through all the data, what this required was getting a high value library of small molecules, which I'll show you in a second, uh, an effective plating process based on acoustic dispensing rather than uh, contact dispensing, uh, and automated data analysis methods, and really sophisticated bioinformatics. Um, and uh, bottom line is that's now been done. Um, and the first example of this was just published uh, last month um, in a paper with Lou Stout, uh, looking at Lou's um, um, uh, most uh, favorite um, uh, type of lymphoma. Uh, and you can go uh, read the paper. It's quite a beautiful paper, but it's what it's doing is identifying uh, compounds that uh, uh, might be um, uh, synergistic with arutinib, which is one of the um, uh, typical compounds used in this kind of uh, uh, B cell lymphoma. Um, and we're applying this to uh, literally 20 other projects uh, now. Um, um, uh, and the reason this is possible is that we spent about two years on technology development, uh, getting the uh, compound uh, uh, acquisition, the dispensing, the, uh, the, the compound management, the, uh, the informatics uh, right. One of the things that also made this possible is we'd spent five years before that developing this, which was uh, the, uh, uh, a complete non-redundant list of every compound ever approved for human use worldwide. Amazingly, when we started doing this back in 2007, I thought there must be such a list, you know, complete non-redundant list of every compound approved for human use, right? It's got to be available. Just Google it. Took them five years to come up with this, variety of reasons. It sort of reads like a like a, a Tom Clancy novel, why it was so hard. But it's all in this paper. It's the, the important thing is, and this is really, a, this is a page right out of the genome book, we did this once to high quality, and then we made all the data public. So it's now in a, it's now in a, in a public database. Anybody can access it. We've got a physical collection of compounds that we collaborate with people all the time to screen. 
Moving on to another problem now, uh, another problem in the, in the translational space is unanticipated toxicity. Um, this, the data are a little bit old now, but, but uh, toxicity accounts for about a third of failures when you're trying to develop a, a novel drug. And, and, and one of the reasons is um, that, that uh, toxicity is really, toxicity testing for the most part um, is, is really stuck in the 1950s. Uh, that is, what, what you do is, if you, if you have a novel drug or a novel chemical, uh, you expose an animal to a, to a certain uh, amount of compound, has a certain tissue dose, and then you pretty much close your eyes and wait for what's called an apical endpoint. That is uh, an observable endpoint. If the animal gets cancer, it dies, something really obvious. And, and then you say, hmm, that was bad. We shouldn't do that again. Kill that compound and go on to the next one. But you, have, you, you very seldom know why it actually caused that problem. So the next time, you don't get any better at, at, at predicting which one is going to be effective. And this gets back to this empiricism problem I was talking about before. So about uh, six or seven years ago, um, we in the EPA and the, and, the F and the FDA and the National Toxicology Program came up with this idea that, well, you know, could you do the mother of all systems biology experiments to solve this problem? And metaphorically, what we're doing, uh, and, and this, will, this will be near and dear to your hearts, because uh, I know this is the way you all think, too, um, we thought, well, okay, instead of giving uh, these chemicals, which are either drugs or environmental chemicals, to the rat, uh, and then watching what happens, we're going to we're going to metaphorically dissect the rat or the human into its component cell types, and it's and then we're going to dissect that into its pathways within those component cell types. We're going to treat all of those pathways within those cell types with all of those different chemicals, look at the effects on the pathways in the cell types and the phenotypes, and then computationally put the rat back together again. So we're actually doing now um, 10,000 different drugs and chemicals in triplicate 15-point dose response in a different pathway assay every week. So it's about 600,000 uh, data points every week. All of this goes in the public data, in the public domain. You can access it. Uh, and, uh, and we're gradually coming up with predictive models using the uh, historical data that we have from animals uh, to try to predict eventually uh, uh, what, what uh, compounds might have uh, adverse effects. Um, so this is the collaboration. It, interestingly, uh, in, has gotten me involved in a world that I never knew before, which is the EPA and the, and the NTP, people who run the Superfund sites. But it's very much the same problem. They're just chemicals that have an adverse effect on human health. Um, somewhat different, uh, for those of you who are chemists, they're somewhat different kinds of chemicals. Um, and this program called TOX21. Uh, and and these, these are the goals, identify patterns of compound-induced biological response to, to identify a toxicity or disease pathways, and eventually develop predictive models for biological response in humans. Um, and it just, just makes the data point, that makes the point that in the last six months we've deposited three, 33 million data points. Uh, uh, that is a, a data point in this case is a chemical at a given concentration with a pathway uh, uh, into PubChem. Um, it's something that I knew would be uh, 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 interesting for you is that it, we've, we've also in this project uh, begun to think, well, you know, we know that, that humans and animals uh, um, uh, vary uh, quite a bit in their response uh, to chemicals. Um, it's otherwise known as pharmacogenetics, right? But in the chemical world, in, in, the, in the environmental chemical world, you see the same thing. So the concept was, hmm, well, could we use, uh, could we study, would it be possible to study uh, the effect of human inherited variation on uh, response to environmental chemicals and drugs. So what we did was we took the 1,086 lymphoblastoid cell lines from the 1,000 Genomes Project, and we uh, screened them in 15-point dose response across about 250 different chemicals. So imagine that. So now we're doing 250 chemicals in duplicate at 15 concentrations times 1,086 different cell lines. This is the kind of thing you could do when you have, you have big honking robots um, and, 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 and you don't have a drug you have to make out at the end. You can really do these kinds of massive experiments. And then you can use response to the chemical or lack thereof, this is a simple cytotoxicity assay in this case, as a quantitative trait that allows you to map the loci responsible for differential sensitivity to the drug or the chemical. And we did a lot of of, of work before this to test whether this crazy idea could even work and whether we have the power. It turns out it did. Uh, it did work. Um, and uh, the paper is now uh, uh, in preparation. But another thing we did, which again was take a, 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 a page out of your book, was to say, well, gosh, you know, this is a huge amount of data. And we have some really smart informatics people, but, you know, wouldn't this be a great thing for, um, for a challenge? So we teamed up with Dream, who were the challenge people, and with Sage Bio Networks, and Steve Friend's uh, operation. Um, 
And we did this uh, challenge with them to use crowdsourcing to better predict the toxicity of chemicals, both the chemical response and the, uh, and the, and the uh, genetic uh, loci responsible. Um, and uh, this paper is now, I should tell you, the, 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 the winner of these, uh, of these, which actually the same team from UT Southwestern, um, the, the, the winner of this challenge didn't get money. They got a, a guaranteed paper in Nature Biotechnology. Um, and we got about 100 uh, submissions uh, to each of these uh, as a result of that without offering anybody any money, which I thought was, was interesting, just a paper and, and bragging rights, which is important. Um, another thing we're doing, which I, I threw in here for, um, uh, uh, for, for Dee Dee's benefit, because I know she's a, a techno geek, uh, and I, I say that with all affection uh, as a fellow techno geek. Um, another thing we're doing in the, tex in the tox toxicology world, um, uh, which you may have heard of, is this tissue chips for drug screening project. This is a classic NCATS project in a couple of ways. First, it addresses a critical bottleneck in the translational process, that is, uh, how do you test for toxicity? Uh, secondly, uh, it's a novel kind of collaboration. This is a collaboration with DARPA. And thirdly, it's focused on logarithmic improvements. This is focused on fundamentally changing the way that we test uh, for, uh, for, for, for uh, effects of drugs. Uh, a different approach from the TOX21 approach, which is a very reductionist uh, pathway, systems biology based. This is an experimental approach using, uh, using microfluidics. So the idea here is um, that, um, that we would have um, instead of uh, a modeling in cells, we would model in three-dimensional organoids of, uh, of, of, in this case, ten different human organs. Um, uh, and these would all be represented on microfluidic platforms that would allow us to infuse, theoretically, um, uh, um, uh, artificial blood into, say, an artificial intestine, which would get, then the, the drug would either get absorbed or not, go, to, go through a microfluidic channel to a, an artificial liver and get metabolized or not, and then go, say, to an artificial kidney and have a toxic effect or not. Well, that's the model. And so um, when this started about two years ago, uh, NIH funded 19 uh, awards in 10 different systems. Um, this is just two examples. This is a lung chip from the VEAS and a blood-brain barrier uh, chip from some folks at Vanderbilt. Uh, and then um, uh, DARPA focused, uh, had two rather large awards uh, focused on the microfluidics and the engineering. Um, I must say, when I, st when I first started working on this, I thought this was completely nuts. I, I thought there's just no way they're going to make they're going to make this work. I must say I was wrong, <laughs> at least, and I'm glad to say I was wrong. So why was I wrong? It's because I underestimated the value of convergence. So, so this is a convergence of, of IPS, ESL technology, biosensor technology, microfluidic technology, and tissue printing, ES, ISIS, cell uh, technology. All of these are, are milestone-driven projects, every one of them without exception, is ahead of its milestones. Um, and so what we're doing now is, uh, now that the individual microsystems of the organs are, are seem to be working reasonably well with the positive controls, they're starting to be put together um, in, in, uh, uh, in groups of two or three. Uh, if I move on to a more, um, a more therapeutically directed uh, program, this is a program that we started in 2009, again, when I was at Genome. Uh, and, and uh, focused on rare diseases, and, and the model here was the same model as the NCGC model, that is, these are obligatory collaborations between academic or small, mo small uh, company investigators who have expertise in a disease or a target, have partially developed an intervention in this case, uh, and, uh, and, and they collaborate with NCATS intramural scientists who have expertise in drug development um, uh, to move these projects to the point where they are, uh, they are uh, adoptable by an outside organization. Uh, usually a biotech or a pharma for, for completion or development, usually after 2A. Um, and uh, so uh, these are the kinds of things that Trend does. Uh, if you look at all of these things, they are very difficult to do or impossible to do um, within a normal academic environment for a lot of reasons. It's hard to get grant support to do this. These are very expensive. They're not hypothesis-driven programs, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so these are all things that, that Trend does. Essentially, they go from where the NCGC ends, which is a lead, to first in human trials. If we can offload these to a company first, uh, before that, because they're de-risked enough, great. Um, but often that doesn't, that doesn't happen. So this is the portfolio, and I, I, don't, I don't want you to read this. I just want you to see, if you could see it, the, the, the therapeutic areas, very broad therapeutic areas, everything from uh, uh, hematologic disease to cancer to infectious disease, neurodegenerative disease, et cetera. Why do we do that? Because we're interested in, in, remember, general principles which will allow us to improve the efficiency of the translational space. In order to have general principles, you have to go across therapeutic areas or else, by definition, you can't argue it's, 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 uh, 
uh, generalizable. If you look at the collaborators, uh, about half of them are academics, half of them are small uh, companies. There are three, actually, with genome. Um, and these all went through peer review, I should say. They, they were not picked by me. So um, I think this says something about the quality of the people at Genome, uh, because there is a lot of competition to get into this program. Um, and so I'm just going to very quickly tell you who, what they are and who they're from. So this is a project on a rare a myopathy with Bill Gall. Um, uh, this is a, 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 it's a classic uh, rare disease to a single gene mutation of GNE. It's a, a disorder of the sialic acid pathway. Um, uh, the important thing is, in this case, uh, Bill was stuck because he didn't uh, have the capacity or the knowledge to do all the IND enabling tox studies uh, or, and hadn't done a natural history study, so didn't know how to approach this problem. So we teamed up with, um, uh, with Bill, and actually within a year, we're off of clinical hold and into patients. Um, this project you may have heard about because it's gotten a lot of uh, notoriety in the press. This is a, a very unusual development project on, with uh, a drug which has been used uh, as an excipient in the past, never an active drug, given intrathecally. Uh, the collaborators here uh, are all of these folks, including Bill Pavin uh, from Genome, who's one of the people involved in cloning the MPC gene about a decade ago or a little more. Um, along with uh, 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 three other universities, uh, four ICs, and two companies uh, involved in this, including J&J, who makes this. Uh, and the important thing is we went through all of these, uh, these milestones in, in a rather rapid fashion, uh, and, and this trial is now uh, uh, in progress at the clinical center as we speak. Important, one of the important things is one of the reasons this works so well is that, that the disease foundations were involved from the very beginning, uh, so they were very uh, uh, clued in and, 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 and uh, hooked into what was going on here. Um, this is a, a, a kind of leukemia that you probably heard about from uh, Paul Yulu. He's been working on this uh, a large amount of his career. This is a fusion um, that results in a, a particular rare type of leukemia. Um, and through an earlier NCGC project, we'd actually identified this compound, uh, which is an old Roche compound, believe it or not, um, uh, which uh, seemed to have an effect on, on, uh, um, on improving um, uh, or, or inhibiting this, uh, the action of this fusion protein. Um, and so this program has now moved into, into trend as well. Um, this one I show not because it's an NHGRI program, but because I want to get back to that Linus Pauling paper. Um, <clears throat> that this is, if this works, this will be the first drug developed against the mechanism of sickle cell disease. So this is, but, but it's a classic example of why these projects are so hard to do. Um, so this is a, a, a collaboration with a company called SRX. It's a virtual company in Boston. Uh, this compound right here, any of you who are chemists, uh, you'd be having a stroke at the moment because that is a really nasty looking compound if you're a chemist. Um, it also has a really problematic potentially mechanism. It binds irreversibly to sickle hemoglobin. When it does that, it shifts the oxygen dissociation curve to the left and allows the sickle erythrocytes to get through the post-capillary venules, the hypoxic environment of the post-capillary venules without sickling. However, the concern was if it, if it covalently binds to sickle hemoglobin, doesn't it covalently bind every other protein in the proteome and kill, cause all sorts of problems? Now, it doesn't, but that was one of the reasons why this company could not get this program uh, could not get support for this program. There's also uh, regulatory issues and, and uh, clinical risk issues. But we partnered with this company and within a year got all the work done, all the tox work, the CMC work, and the regulatory work to be in the patients. And it's now, it's been through two uh, phase one, uh, and a phase one and a phase two A trial. It's now in a phase two B trial um, uh, now. And the biomarkers are great. Oh, that's all I can say. Um, so we're really excited about this. Okay, so I'm going to skip through this one. Okay, I'm just going to finish with ORDR. So you're all aware of this because Genome has been a partner of ORDR since it started. Um, uh, since, uh, uh, and uh, so ORDR is, another, is now part of NCATS. Um, <clears throat> and there, there are a number of things that I just want to point out. Uh, one is this uh, rare disease clinical research network. It's a rather remarkable uh, network of 17 different consortia um, uh, working at over 200 institutions. Uh, uh, important things about these is that they don't work on individual diseases. They, they, they insist on grouping diseases, that is either by cell type or by pathway or something, um, so as you don't work on one disease at a time. Um, and secondly, every one of them has to have a patient advocacy group as a, as a, as a critical and integral member of, of the, uh, of, of, of the, of the, of the uh, consortium. Um, 
And this repository uh, uh, is something that we're actually very excited about, too. It's uh, so one of those uh, things that's sort of similar to the, you think about the, the, the problem in the old days of doing, um, uh, doing genetic linkage studies. You remember how it was very hard to get funding to, to, uh, to acquire and phenotype patients to do linkage studies, um, and it really held back the field. That's what's going on in therapeutic development now, so it's one of the things we're working on. Working on. And this Genetic and Rare Disease Information Center that, of course, has been funded uh, with Genome um, uh, for many years now. Um, and uh, this is a, uh, an, an information center that gets about 500 calls a month, uh, generally from patients and p parents who have just gotten a very bad diagnosis to help them with uh, what this disease is, how to find you know, advocacy groups and practitioners, experts in the field, et cetera. Um, this is the, uh, the, the uh, these are the consortia that are part of the, uh, of the um, uh, Rare Disease Clinical Research Network. And if you just look at the names of a few of these, like the Lysosomal Disease Network, these work on the 40 lysosomal diseases. Uh, so this is a, a organelle. There are other ones that work on, on phenotypes. This is rare kidney stones. Uh, and then this one is, is, a, is a, a clinical syndrome, nephrotic syndrome. Um, and then uh, this one is more of a, uh, uh, more of a, a, a syndrome as well, autonomic rare diseases of the nervous system. So I just want to finish with this, uh, that, that overview of what NCATS does. So a lot of you know Steve Groft, um, who has been a, a, a real icon in this community for the last 30 years, was actually at the FDA when the Orphan Drug Act was passed in 1983. Um, and shortly thereafter, left the FDA to go to what then, what then was the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare to get uh, orphan products or orphan uh, uh, orphan products started and orphan research started within HHS, what's now HHS. Um, he um, retired on Saturday, um, and so this is a big change for us. Um, those of you who know Steve know he is an absolutely extraordinary. Uh, visionary and advocate for rare diseases, rare disease research, understanding and treatment. Um, he is not replaceable, clearly, um, and so we are going to have him uh, stay on with us as probably a half-time uh, consultant um, because he's really critical for what we're doing. Um, but we are going to be recruiting for a replacement for Steve, and so if you know folks who are in the rare disease community, um, uh, I'd like to hear about them when we put the ad out. What I'm looking for is, is really to go, um, uh, to, to go uh, genome-wide for this problem. Uh, and the way I describe this is, you know, uh, Steve and his incredible efforts have, have focused uh, um, um, attention on the problem of rare diseases, uh, but for the most part they've been on individual diseases. And we now have the opportunity to globalize this question. Because rare diseases, they, they, they're 6,000 independent, independent research diseases, but of course they're connected with each other in ways that we don't understand. And so the next uh, 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 director of this office, I want somebody to be somebody who thinks of the rare disease problem as a problem and, and probably has a, 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 a heavy interest and in knowledge in informatics uh, and thinks about systems, um, not on individual diseases. Uh, so it's really an opportunity to take this whole uh, effort to the next level. However, uh, it's important, and there have been some <laughs> questions actually, oh gosh, is NCATS going to abandon rare diseases because Steve's leaving? Give me a break. Uh, no, <laughs> we're not. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we are, um, uh, as I've often told Steve, I think in many ways NCATS is a validation uh, of all the things um, uh, Steve has done over the last 30 years. So it's going to continue its important work, but I love this picture uh, as um, Steve rides into the sunset. Uh, those of you who are physicians will know why he's riding a, riding a zebra. Um, uh, if you don't know what that is, I will ask you to talk to Bob Nussbaum. He can tell you. Um, and with that, we are done. So I just leave you with this. You're going to have these slides. Certainly, I'm glad to hear from you about anything, but if you're interested in any of these projects, any of these areas, I want you to have the contact information for the people who do these. Um, and uh, be glad to take a few questions before I run back uh, and try to deal with our steering committee. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, Jim. So that was great. I, I was just wondering, um, it seems like a lot of problems with therapeutics boils down to engineering and delivery, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, it, that's why we look for small molecules, yeah. because, well, we can get them into places. Do you have a concerted effort looking at ways of targeting things? Yeah. And 
Yeah, I, I actually should have I actually should have said this because it's so um, so yes, w w one of the things, and, and you probably didn't see it because I flipped through it so fast in the NCGC slide. The only way we're going to get to predictability and being able to target is to understand what the general principles are uh, that govern small molecule target interactions. We don't understand that. And it's really interesting to think about. If you think about genetics, if we did not understand sense I and I sense, that A goes with T, G goes with C, if you didn't understand that, how would you do genetics? But we don't understand that in this space, so everything's empirical. So because this space is so much more complicated, there are three-dimensional structures that are floppy and change shape and all that stuff, um, we really need to generate massive amounts of data and then work backwards to identify what those principles are, what those patterns are. And uh, that's a lot of what the NCGC now is going to be able to do. Um, it's been sort of distracted from doing this for a variety of reasons for the last couple of years. The other thing that we're doing is, is working a lot with a structural biologist to see um, how we can marry those a little bit better. It's made a little bit more difficult by the fact that the PSI has gone away, but um, we'll deal with that. Um, we're also working very closely with, um, uh, with uh, 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 engineers both at DARPA and at, um, uh, at, uh, in pharmas about novel ways to identify uh, compounds more efficiently. Um, but I, I would say overall, it's a matter of understanding what the general principles are. You know, I often say that, you know, the robots that we have can screen, they screen, the big one screens about three million wells a week, which is great. But the fact that we are screening three million wells to find a compound that might work is prima facie evidence that we have no idea what we're looking for. So eventually, I want to put the screeners out of business because we'll be able to target them. So thanks, Chris. Um, Behind your e-rooms law there, of course, yeah. as you know very well, there's a sort of a flat rate of yeah. new drugs. Yep. The problem is, well, that, that, that that's flat, but also the problem is that the cost is going up and therefore yep. this, the overall slope is low. Yep. Part of the reason that cost is going up so much is because things are failing really late in the process. Yep. And, and part of the reason there is because 15 years before, the things they chose to work on were never going to work. Right. right. The targets were never going to get you there because they weren't relevant to the human disease they were being developed for for a lot of money. Yep. So with all that logic, it seems to me your position to do something nobody else on the planet could be, that is sitting amongst the other institutes with yeah. access to the extramural expertise who know more about those targets than anybody else right. anywhere. Right. What are you doing in that regard to really draw, draw out the, yeah. the expertise that exists yeah. extramurally and amongst the institutes? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and it is, you're absolutely right, it is a unique advantage that we have, uh, and we use it a lot. Uh, we also have the FDA on speed dial, and that helps. doesn't help with the target validation question, but it helps with others. Um, you, you might have noticed this AMP thing. I know you're part of this, this advanced medicines partnership which came out last week. It's really a target validation effort is really what it is. Um, the, and, and so we are uh, very deeply engaged in conversations uh, with the, the institutes about doing this in individual projects. I was just uh, at a meeting not long ago on, on Alzheimer's disease uh, in, this, in this arena. Um, and uh, I would say the other thing we're focused on is, is general enabling validation technologies uh, and how do we make those work better? Um, and the genome-wide RNAi thing is a perfect example. Um, I think that'll be a great technology now, now that it's been worked out how to do it. So I realize you, you inherited uh, 40 years of GCRC and uh, several years of CTSA. Yeah. But I would, I would like to encourage you to keep your logarithm uh, measure uh, with that, that group, um, having been amongst two CTSAs. Uh, the goal is not always logarithmic advances. <laughs> um, the goal is uh, sometimes sustaining the 40-year yes. legacy. And yeah. so I would uh, just encourage you to keep pressing on with that yeah. uh, because uh, we all need it. Oh, thank you so much. Where, can I ask where you were? What were the two places? No. <laughs> no. Yeah, so you, is Eric, oh, is, is, oh, yeah, okay. As Eric, as Eric was telling me before, um, <clears throat> we are, uh, we are, um, pushing that agenda quite aggressively now um, because it absolutely has to be done uh, uh, for all kinds of reasons. The opportunity is huge. Um, and uh, so I got a lot of people mad. And so as Eric said, hmm, must be doing something useful if you got a people mad. <laughs> so, so yeah, it is. And, and it, uh, I think the good thing about it is that, that the PIs really understand the opportunity here. 
Um, but they have they what what I often discovered they were lacking is is clear uh, a clear mission from NIH about what they were supposed to do. Um, and so I would say the vast majority of them are really excited about this. Well, I think Lon's comment really comes back to part of the problem too. Is you're working on things that never should have been started in the first place. Yeah. And you know the old uh, if you have a hammer, everything looks yeah, like right. a nail. Well, the answer to every question is the assay that's running in my lab. Yeah, right. um, and just you know throw it on through. And so we, you know we need to get past that. And yeah. like you said, some of it's going to be mission led. Um, and certainly at University of North Carolina and at Washington University, where I was previously, yeah. um, there was a lot of good things happening. Yes. A lot of it wasn't. Yep. So while we're talking about TJ, one last question. Yeah. Uh, just before you go, so you, you want to say anything about some of the conversations we've had thinking about as, as we're looking at opportunities and we are yeah. funding programs moving into the clinical arena, the application yeah. of genomics, and often at their institutions that have CPSAs. Yeah, so, so one of the things that I'm most excited about, as you might imagine, <clears throat> is that um, the, 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 the very things that I think are needed uh, in the genomic medicine space actually at least are theoretically available through the CTSA program. It really is complementary to, uh, to what I did at Genome and and a lot of the early preclinical things that we do uh, at NCATS. Um, and so I think these, these questions of not only uh, uh, genetic disease therapeutic development, which is kind of a minor part of what we do, but on a, on a, on a more fundamental level, uh, for instance, how is it that uh, 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 genetic circuits are put together uh, as analyzed through the lens of knocking down every gene one at a time? And there's a lot of really cool experiments to do in that space. When you think about one of the major problems that we work in the clinical space, which is how do you identify uh, people via um, biomarkers, which could be genetic biomarkers, uh, for, for treatment and then test those hypotheses in a, in a rigorous but efficient way. Um, those are things which are of great interest to uh, many of the people at the institutions which have CTSAs. So, so if, if we can harness that, um, then I think there's, there's some really remarkable things that we can do together. I think from my own point of view, um, the problem, the limitation in this at this point is not genome, it's us, because you know, we have some work to get our own house in order to, to, to be good partners with you. Um, but I, I really think there are enormous things that we should do together. And it will not surprise you to learn that as somebody who spent nine months in genome, this is how I think. Nine years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah nine, nine years. years. Yeah, thank you. Nine years. <laughs> and nine months. Oh, there you go. Okay. Any okay. last quick question before Chris has to race out the door? Okay. Good. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, Terry, you're up next.